I would be really surprised, Gunner. In fact, I'd be shocked. Um, I think Jay, one of the things that Jay always said was that he felt like he had the best job in college basketball at Villanova. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome all back. Sports Take. Jacob Media YouTube Network. Smash that like button. We appreciate everybody. All our comments. Hey, let me throw this out there, by the way, guys. We got Derek Gunn, Barrett Brooks. I'm Rob Ellis. Mike Sealski in one second here. So coming up a little bit later in the show, uh, we're going to be, and I'm going to utilize this every day, guys. So everybody who's watching and all the folks who are commenting, love it. Keep it rolling, man. But you fire off some good questions for us regarding the Eagles and the draft a little bit later. We will use them and we will answer your questions. So we encourage good questions. The good ones will make the cut and we will utilize them. All right. So we mentioned yesterday, guys, the big news in addition to the Sixers winning was Jay Wright retiring. And joining us now, I love talking to Mike about any number of subjects, whether it's college hoops, whether it's the NBA, NFL, his favorite sport, baseball, you name it across the board. We talk <laughs> Follow on Twitter at Mike Sealski. does an amazing job for the Philadelphia Inquirer as the columnist, the one and only. There he is. What's happening, Mike? Gentlemen, Rob, how are you? Ah, good, Mike. Wait, yeah, wait, he's wait, definitely wait. not a gentleman. Uh, you know, Rob is not a he's, hey, You two you know are gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, we're well. the gentleman. He's not the gentleman. That's why I said Rob. No, no. <laughs> I Thanks for pointing that out. Right. The one thing I love about Mike is, man, he slides those zingers in so smoothly. <laughs> man. He's so, smooth as silk. You know what it is, Gunner? I, I don't want you to know that the knife has entered your belly until you look down <laughs> and, then and see the puddle up. of blood at your feet. Yeah, and all your insides are hanging out. <laughs> and I'm That's done, it, man. That's it. Oh, oh, Mike, okay. first off, great job uh, on your on your piece on Jay. Um, mm, thanks. And I, I know how closely, you know, the Big Five, how near and dear it is to your heart, the Big Five. And Villanova's done laps around every other school. We know that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But let me pose this one. Let me come out of the, the shoot swinging here. Greatest Philadelphia coach in history, Ooh. Jay Wright. He's close. Rob, I actually wrote a column about this a few years ago, right after uh, Villanova had won its second national championship under him. And I had him in the top five then. And the fact that they got back to another Final Four uh, and that he's been inducted into the Hall of Fame since then, I think only raises him on those rankings. I mean, Connie Mack, if you really want to go back a long way, mm -hmm. um, because he was so integral to what the athletics did when they were a dynasty. Mm -hmm. But other than that, man, it's hard to think of anybody else who would surpass Jay. I, I, I think there's a lot to what you're saying. Yeah. And when you ask that, it sounds hot takey and blasphemous. And But if you really dig into it, I mean, the sustained success, Mike, over a, a two decade plus period, I mean, 21 years he's at Villanova, he wins it twice. He gets the four Final Fours. You know, the one, the COVID year you take out because there wasn't even a tournament. And, you know, we don't even really talk about that that much. I think he's missed one NCAA tournament going back uh, to, you know, 16 years, something like that. It's unbelievable. And, and to do it at a small school like that, not some gigantic state school. It, it is remarkable. And you think back to, uh, and I mentioned this in this story you were talking about today, like it was not, it was in the realm of possibility after his third year, um, that if, if Villanova didn't turn things around in his fourth year, that he was going to get fired. Mm -hmm. uh, the boosters and the alumni were out for him. And that was 2004, 2005. That was the year Nova really took off under Jay. They had Alan Ray and Randy Foy, and they went 24-8 and eight, made the Sweet 16. Think about this, too. Nova won the Big East regular season championship eight times under Jay. Wow. And won the conference tournament five times, including this year. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, that's not that's not the Atlantic 10. That's not the CAA. That's the Big East. Even in its more recent iteration, it's still a great basketball conference. So to 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 do what he did, you know, sometimes I think in Philadelphia, we kind of need to take a step back and understand and appreciate where somebody like Jay like fits into the national scope of things. Like you're right. Mm -hmm. Villanova dominates the big five. But they're right there with Duke and have been for the last five to ten years as as good as any program in college basketball. So, what do we call it? Blue something? Blue, blue blood. Blue blood. Yeah. Blue blood. Yeah. Well, I mean, he has to be put in that type of, you know, in, in that type of realm as far as, you know, 
highly you know prized basketball schools. And the mere fact, like you said, of being able to recruit athletes that not necessarily the you know the the top athletes you know that Kentucky gets, that Duke gets, North Carolina gets, he gets guys that are are basically Villanova type of guys, not the one and done so much. You know what I'm saying? Just a testament to how he coaches. Yeah, and Barrett, you've put your finger on what I think, and I'm actually writing a column about this right now. What I think is one of the big reasons that he did step away. You know, I, I've been spent the last 24 hours talking to people, uh, reaching out to people close to the program and close to Jay, and they all say a couple of things. Number one, he was 60. He wanted to leave on top. He had talked for a while about wanting to get out at a relatively young age. You know, we don't think of Jay as being 60 because of his looks and his vibrancy and all those things, but. He wanted to get out while he was on top. He was getting kind of tired of the gig. And part of being tired of the gig was having to deal with the new landscape of college sports, the Mm. transfer portal and the NIL changes. And one of the things he said during the NCAA tournament was that it would probably take schools about three years to really figure out how to negotiate this new landscape where players can make money or they can transfer. And, And to your point, Barrett, like Villanova players come in Jay is really tough on them when they're young. They got to kind of survive the first year or two and then their game takes off. And then they become these guys who stay three or four years and play their way into the NBA or into a pro career. And I got to think Jay at some level was looking at this new landscape and saying, you know, it's going to be harder for me to keep these guys around because of the way I coach. You know, we see him as gregarious, lovable Jay. He is tough on his players. There's a reason his practices are closed every regular season. And so if he's not going to, if those guys can walk away and say, you know what, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm going to go somewhere else and play right away. It was going to be harder for him to maintain that level of excellence. And then if it's going to take three years to figure it out, now you're looking at him being 63, 64 years old, and he's missed that window for when he wanted to get out. So, so Mike, then let me ask you this. Now that you brought up the age factor, do you think there's a slight possibility Jake, could deliberately take a step back, breathe, enjoy his family, and then start looking at potential NBA offers. Because that's been swirling about Jay for a long time. Would he make the transition to the next level? He's deflected it well over the last few years, but now that he's officially stepping away from college, do you think he might entertain some of these potential offers in the future? I would be really surprised, Gunnar. In fact, I'd be shocked. Um, I think Jay, one of the things that Jay always said was that he felt like he had the best job in college basketball at Villanova because it brought all the spoils of being at a big time program without the scrutiny and the pressure that Mike Krzyzewski or Roy Williams or Bill Self or John Calipari faced in their markets. The, the temptation that came up for him with the NBA, generally speaking, came from only a couple different places like the Sixers or maybe the Lakers or the Knicks. Well, guess what? Like he, he's smart enough to know he's not going to go work for James Dolan in New York. If somebody right. else owned that franchise, maybe Jay, Jay knows working for Dolan is a dead end street. Um, look at the Lakers and the disarray that they're in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he and his family are going to want to go to anywhere else at this stages of their lives. Are they going to go to Oklahoma City or Memphis or any of these other places where there are NBA franchises, I would be really, really surprised if that happened. In fact, I would mm. I would say it's like next to nil that that's going to happen. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, to your point, I think what really cemented that part of it is coaching Team USA being one of the assistants. As much as he enjoyed it, and, and what a God, what an honor that is to be able to do that. You also get around these guys up close and personal, and you realize. I don't have the same power that I have in college, man. Like, you know, you don't do what, what I need you to difference. do. Yeah, you're sitting on the bench. These guys do what they want because they're making more money than you are right. because ultimately they're running the show. And I think I don't think that jives well with the way Jay does things. I still remember during Villanova's um, 2016 championship run, I asked Josh Hart, at the you know, who at the time was still on Villanova about this. And he said exactly what, you know, basically exactly what you said, Rob, like there's a difference between telling me Josh Hart as a junior or senior at Villanova to hit the floor after a loose ball and telling Kobe Bryant to do it. And that difference is pretty stark. And I think you're right. I think Jay got, you know, to, to similar to what, you know, Shashevsky dealt with as the head coach of the Olympic team. He got his taste of, of dealing with the best players on the planet 
And that probably scratched that itch for him. And he doesn't need to, to run the show and prove himself anymore. He can walk away knowing he's a Hall of Famer already uh, and one of the greatest college coaches of all time. Mm. Well, Mike, let me ask you. So obviously you got to, the winning has to come with this part of it. it. You know, you can be the nicest guy in the world and, and it doesn't matter if you go two and, you know, 30, but be, so the, 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 the preface is that you know, the, the premise is J one, but it's the way he went about things. I think that that puts him at a different level too. the way he carried himself. The, look, there was a lot that went on when Roley was here and, and, and the, and, you know, there was a lot of elitist kind of stuff. There was a lot of who cares about Philadelphia stuff that went on. Jay being from here was just such a natural advantage. And he got Philadelphia and just the way he treated people. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, look, if Jay had had any other kind of personality, it would have been, he would have been a villain in this town. Because let's face it, he and Villanova burned the big five to the ground. Hmm. It, is, it doesn't really exist anymore because Villanova is so dominant compared to the other four schools in the city, you know, and again, Villanova is not in the city. That's okay. You know, the university isn't a Philadelphia university, but that the basketball most program. The stupid parochial provincial yes, argument that, that there's ever been in Philadelphia. The basketball is that program. Nonsense. Yes. Give me a freaking right. break. Anyway. And, and, and Jay appreciated that history and talked about it and really loved it and lived it so that even though he and Villanova was dominating the region, you never felt like. There was resentment because of it. And then the other thing, the other component of what you're talking about, and Gunner can appreciate this, is somebody who made his living asking athletes and coaches questions and trying to get insightful mm -hmm. answers from them and often getting those kinds of answers. Jay was the all-time best. My old colleague Bob Ford and I have talked about this. The all-time best at understanding who was asking a question of him, mm -hmm. what they were really getting at, and then giving you the answer that, you wanted or needed or were looking for from him. There's nobody that's ever been better in that regard. Like genuinely, genuinely insightful mm -hmm. for the most part would not lie to you, would mm -hmm. tell you like, Hey, I can't answer that as opposed to just saying something that was false. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for those reasons, to your point, Rob, like he's beloved here in a way that, gosh, it was a real challenge for his, some of his predecessors to be that beloved at Villanova. Mm. Well, let me ask you this, man. You know, in, in just the mere fact that, you know, he's going to have that itch. He's going to be, I mean, not to say he's going to be like, you know, Brady and want to come back, but is he totally away from baseball? I mean, uh, basketball, is he totally in a position where, all right, um, I'm just going to separate myself or do you see him going and getting a front office job or, you know, maybe, a, you know, a job where he's going to be a liaison or, or you know, kind of help a team, you know, maybe an NBA team, you know, because his talent evaluation, you know, is, 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 is right there. You know, he can get those type of athletes, you know, so I mean, you think he's totally out of basketball. Where do you think he is going forward? I think that's a greater possibility, Barrett, than him coming back and coaching again. Now, I say this having been there in New Orleans and being with Jay in the immediate aftermath of that loss to Kansas, and even though he had said he had been contemplating coming back to coaching, uh, or stepping away from coaching, excuse me, in the aftermath of that loss to Kansas, I thought he's going to be back. Like, of course he's going to be back. This loss crushed him. He talked about, you know, this will fuel the fire for next time, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, to Gunner's earlier question, I'd be stunned if he got back into coaching but you have to leave the little sliver of possibility. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more likely that he becomes either some kind of analyst, college basketball, NBA, or otherwise, and that like a consulting job, like almost like a consigliere to an NBA team or, you know, Villanova, you know, he's going to be a special assistant to uh, Father Peter Donahue, the president of Villanova now. Um, I think that's more likely um, right. that, that he stays connected to the game and the sport in that way, you know, would it surprise me to see him on Fox, you know, analyzing games or on CBS? No, it would not surprise me. Would it surprise so, me to see him get hired by an NBA team as a front office consultant? It, it would surprise me a little bit more, but I could see that potentially happen. So, Mike, how much do you think family influenced his decision? Huge. I think, I think family influ influenced a lot. Gunner, I think Patty, right, his wife was kind of tiring of the life, too. Um, his kids are hitting that age where – they're starting to move on in their lives. And, you know, I mean, J Jay, like I said earlier, Jay's always kind of known how good he had it. And it was always that balance of how much is he going to test himself? Because mm -hmm. coaches at that level always want to push and see how great they really are. And how much is he really going to live what he says, which is, hey, I'm where I want to be. 
I love the Philadelphia area. I love Villanova. I love what I get to do. You know, I've got it great and I'm not going to mess up a great thing. Right. Um, so, you know, gun to my head, I, I think he's going to say, you know what? I got time to spend with my family now. I've been worn down the last couple of years and, and it's time for me to give to them. Mike, yeah. you got the direct contact with him. Tell him to come fishing with the three of us, man. We'll, I'll take him out fishing, okay? <laughs> he would de- he, I, I'll tell you this, Barrett. He'd be the best dressed fish- fisherman in this. <laughs> no question. No question. <laughs> He would yeah. step out on the boat in Gucci shoes, you know, Hugo Boss fishing attire. You know. Yeah, the guy, the guy would wear Uggs fishing boots. It'd be That's amazing. Right. That's right. It would be unbelievable. Mike, let me, let's not lose sight, too, of what an unbelievable tactician this guy was, too. I mean, there's the culture. There's what a good guy he is. But the the let's the run in in sixteen was straight dominance. I, I don't they didn't lose a game by less than twelve. I, I mean they took every or I'm sorry in eighteen, 18. They, t- they took everybody apart in that. I mean we all remember sixteen when Chris Jenkins hits the shot, but eighteen they just ran through everybody. That was as dominant a tournament run as there's ever been in in the NCAA tournament. And then think back even farther, Rob, to that 0405 season and the following year when you had. You know, Randy Foy, Alan Ray, Mike Nardi, and Kyle Lowry playing a four guard lineup, you know, which was kind of revolutionary at the time. I mean, I can remember that in 2006, they beat Boston College in overtime in the Sweet 16. And Randy Foy, who was 6'4, was playing basically power forward Mm. for Villanova, you know, bodying guys, defending guys in the post. And that Boston College team they beat in the Sweet 16 was much bigger and much more of a down low kind of oriented team. But Jay figured out, you know, this is the way I can win with these guys. And that was the starting pistol, so to speak, Mm -hmm. for the greatness that was to come, you know. And he figured out a little bit later, you know, what kind of kid do I need to look for to recruit? What kind of player am I looking for? You know, the kind of kid who combines terrific talent with a willingness to grow and improve and room to grow and improve so that take – Take 16. You've got Ryan Archie Diacono and Josh Hart and Chris Jenkins um, and, um, you know, Daniel Ochefu, guys who have been around for two, three years who are at the, their peak physically, mentally, maturity wise, and who are able to make that championship run. And then you get to 18 and my God, that team is the best. I think that's the best college basketball team of the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah, they're loaded. A lot of guys playing in the yeah. pros, that's for sure. Yeah. So, Mike, any surprise that they go Kyle Neptune? I mean, certainly a lot of guys to choose from who were a part of Jay's staff, et cetera. He let Kyle left for one year, went to Fordham, did a great job at a, in a really tough spot with Fordham. He comes back. He had been an assistant from 08 to 10 and then 13 to 21. Any surprise that it was him? And how much influence do you think Jay had? Oh, I think Jay had a had a fair bit of influence. And if you look at Kyle Neptune's resume, no, not a surprise. First of all, anyone who goes 500 at Fordham should be NCAA <laughs> coach of the year, given the history of that, the recent history of that program. <laughs> Secondly, Kyle was Jay's top or one of top assistants during that, that stretch where the, the Big East kind of reemerged in its new iteration, right? Built around basketball, around these smaller, generally private schools until UConn came back. And that, that was the rocket ride to dominance that the program saw. So Kyle was there for it. He's 37, so he's younger. He's you know in touch with this new landscape of college sports and how all these changes we talked about are going to affect things. Um, you know, once you get past the initial surprise, pardon me, of, oh my God, Jay Wright is retiring. You look and you see who the, re- the successor is and you say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, speaking of that, you know, on the, if you look at the um, stream, it says, uh, Frank, uh, wasn't it? Gradia? Gradia? Yeah, I was looking yeah. at that. Yeah. Do you think Villanova has to worry about anybody transferring out? And do you think any recruits will be back, will back out? That's going to be something that Villanova is going to go through uh, this year, maybe next year, you know, I mean, well, you know, how do they go forward? You know, I mean, I know they're gonna it's gonna step down a whole lot, but can they survive? I think they can survive for a couple of years because you've got guys there now who have been inculcated into the program, right? Um, you know, are all of these guys gonna come back? I don't know, but but guys like Brandon Slater and Caleb Daniels and hopefully Justin Moore when he recovers um, you know, from the torn Achilles and um Oh, the kid from Doylestown, and I'm drawing a blank, and I Dixon, shouldn't. Dixon. Eric Dixon will be back. He's from Abington. Um, Jordan Bening, uh, Beningo. Um, yeah. uh, you know, he. even if you lose one or two of those guys, you're still going to have a chance for a pretty strong team, and presumably 
there will be more guys looking to transfer in. But look, this is going to be brand new. And I right. and again, I think Jay looked at this landscape and said, you know, I've got this formula. And this new way of doing things jeopardizes that formula to the point that once I figure it out, I'm not sure I'm going to have the energy to keep coaching. Mike, let me ask you while we have you, because I'd love to jump around with you a little bit, the Sixers last night. And, you know, just a mess in the first half, especially in the first quarter. Turned the ball over a ton and beat five points in the first half. The game's in Toronto. They're hitting threes. If there's ever a game they're going to take, you would think it'd be that one. But somehow, some way, they come away with a victory. Just give me your impressions of last night and where you think this thing stands. Is it over Saturday? A, I think it's over. B, I think uh, crowning achievements so far jo- for Joel Embiid, the way he played in that second half in overtime, and then obviously the shot he hits at the end. And the third thing I would say, Rob, and I wrote this the day before, it is if you are a Sixers fan, it is so nice to be able to watch a team that plays loosely, that plays like it's not afraid of making mistakes mm-hmm. and doesn't have to play four on five on offense because the point guard acts like the basketball is a hand grenade with the pin pulled. <laughs> I mean, you know, the difference between having Ben Simmons out there and having Tyrese Maxey and or James Harden is so stark and so obvious that even somebody who's never watched basketball before can see it. And I think that makes a huge difference. I think mm-hmm. it's a reason to think that this team can make a pretty deep run and is going to be a pretty tough out. Hey, Mike, I want to ask you about the book, man, The Rise, because I, a very insightful book, you know, and obviously you put a lot of research into this thing. How's the book Congratulations done? Congratulations also. Yeah. yeah Thanks. How's the book done so far in terms of sales and responses you've gotten on it? Uh, the response has been great, Gunnar. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah. You know, everybody who has read it or more importantly, bought it because uh, I got mouse to feed. Um <laughs> has really responded very positively to it. Um, sales have been very steady. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to build a marketing campaign around the anniversary of an icon's death. Um, so you have to approach that with some trepidation. You want, of course, I want people to read the book. Uh, I'm proud of the work I put into it, but it's hard to say, Hey, it's been two years since Kobe Bryant died. You should read my book about him. You know, that makes it a little bit challenging. Um, but as I said, the response has generally been very good. I think there's some, some good news down the pike, um, for the, for the book and a, and a broader project. And I'll just kind of leave it at that for now. Um, but, uh, thanks for asking and, and everything's been really good with it. Where can folks get it, Mike? Uh, we well, can get it at Amazon local bookstores. The easiest thing to do is to go to, uh, www.theriseofkobebook.com and you can order it from anywhere. Even go to like Target or Costco. Mm. You know, Barrett, Gunner, when you guys are shopping for your fishing trips, you know, there just you pick go. up a copy of the book and go. like a giant can of Beefarino and Da-da-da. just get ready to go. Beefarino. So, so, so how many years did you put into researching the book before you put it to paper? Well, I mean, I had written about Kobe and, and covered Kobe a little bit here and there for years. Right. Um, and I, I had contacts with people who were close to him when he was at Lower Marion. Um, from the time I got the idea and got the contract until the time I finished uh, the first draft of the manuscript was about 11 months. And then you turn in the manuscript and the publisher takes it. It's got to be edited and dressed up and you got to get photos and all that kind of stuff. So it basically took like two years, the whole process, but it took me about a year, uh, a little bit less than that, to write the actual book. Right. And Mike, the crux of it is the early years of Kobe. What sort of drove him to get to superstardom? Give us maybe one anecdote or one thing that really blew you away. And, and there there it is right there. Kobe Bryant and the Pursuit of Immortality, The Rise by Mike Sealski. Great, great cover and great title, by the way. Uh, one thing that really just sort of, whoa, took even took you back, someone who had done a lot of research on him. So when Kobe was 15 or 16, he had a friend named Anthony Gilbert, who he had gotten to know. I know Anthony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really good guy. guy. Um, still around the NBA quite a bit. And Anthony yep. had gotten to know Kobe through Kobe's older sister, uh, uh, Sharia. So the two of them would drive around to basketball courts and playgrounds in and around the city. And they would play. But they would play a particularly interesting kind of basketball. Anthony had two jobs. He would rebound for Kobe while Kobe was dunking and shooting threes and working on his footwork and, you know, doing all these drills that Kobe would put himself through. Mm -hmm. And he would scream at Kobe, you're soft. You go to a white school. You couldn't play in the public league, like literally screaming at him. And Kobe wanted him to do this because this was kind of like the emotional armor that Kobe was going to put on 
against the trash talking and the intimidation tactics that he was already experiencing in high school and that he knew he would experience in the NBA. Mm. And to have a kid who's 15 or 16 thinking that way at that age and so devoted and so blinkered and single-minded that he would prepare himself that way to be what he turned out to be, which was the greatest basketball player on the planet, that sort of thing blew me away. We, you can hear all you want about the Mamba mentality and you know being devoted to greatness, but until you hear an anecdote like that, I'm not sure anybody really has an appreciation for what that means. Was that that's still, incredible? Yeah. yeah, was that from his dad, Mike, who, who obviously played at, at the highest level as well, I, I, or is that just Kobe innate in him? I think it's innate, partly innate in him. I think most of that comes from his mother, Pam. She was really the strong one, you know, had the strong personality right. in the family. But of course, Kobe had also seen Joe play in the NBA, have to cut his career short because it didn't quite work out the way Joe would have wanted it to, have mm. to go abroad and play in Italy. And I think that served as a motivating force for Kobe early in his life. I'm going to restore the Bryant good name in the world of basketball, and I'm going to do it by not necessarily making the same mistakes that my dad made or not allowing people to control my future in the way my dad's future was controlled by the Sixers for trading him or the Rockets for releasing him or things like that. Hmm. That's tough, man, because I never never had that. Like, I mean, I played in the NFL 12 years, you know, um, got drafted in the second round, but there was no way that I was thinking like that Um, at, at 15. I wasn't thinking like that up until two years before I got drafted. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It, it, to, to me, that's like mind boggling to have that much focus and intensiveness, you know, that it, at that point in his life at 14, 15, 16 years old, I'm thinking about girls and everything else. I'm not <laughs> thinking about playing, you know, and, and having somebody yell at me. That's like mind boggling. We, we know it, what's interesting though, Barrett, is that I know for a fact that Rob Ellis, when he was like 15, used to walk around <laughs> Delaware County, like screaming sports takes at people. I did. So, you know, you you may not have had that mentality, but I think Rob and Kobe did. The only difference is I got punched for doing it. So that, really, <laughs> kinda, See, that was I'm my armor. I'm yeah. not surprised that Kobe had that mentality at that age because I covered his dad, Joe Jellybean Bryant, when he played briefly for the San Diego Clippers. Jeez. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, his dad was never a, a great player. He was a good player, a good role player. He wasn't a great player. But one thing Joe was, he was a stickler for detail. And you could tell that in his son. You know, that, that, you know, Joe, you know, he, he didn't like losing like nobody did, but he was a stickler for the little things, you know, and he was a workaholic. And you can see that in his son in, in terms of how Kobe turned out. Kobe took it to a whole nother level. Yeah. Because when you hear Shaq talking about Kobe, while everybody's in a hotel out in the club, Kobe's in the gym shooting 100 jumpers, 100 free throws. See, that's what separated the group, good ones from the great ones. And I know uh, Kobe got that foundation from his dad. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, Gunner. I think, you know, Kobe lived it and worked it every single day yeah. in a way that even his dad couldn't approximate. You know, his dad, right. in fairness, his dad was also the kind of guy who would, like, miss the team bus from the hotel to practice True. True. sometimes. Um, so, a- hey, look, any athlete who gets to that level is going to be a stickler for details and work his tail off and all of that. So, as Barrett said, there's this, and then there's mm-hmm. Kobe and, yeah. you know, athletes and figures like yeah. him. Mike, did they uh, not to end this on a sad note? But did, did they ever reconcile? I, I know they that, that Kobe and his parents had a falling out w- w- before he passed. I, I I'm curious. Have, do you know about that? Not to my knowledge, they didn't, Rob. And okay. you know, it's funny. I reached out to Joe and Pam. Um, I sent them a letter and sent them samples of my writing to try to get them to uh, agree to be interviewed for the book. I would have loved to have spoken with them. Mm. Um, they didn't respond. I heard from intermediaries that they uh, was they were aware I was doing the book. Um, but they have spoken publicly not once yeah. since his death. Right. And right. I got to think that that's a big reason why, that they always felt like there'd yeah. be time for them to reconcile because they were mm-hmm. such a close family when he was young. And yeah. uh, that's one of the things that just breaks my heart every time I think about it. That's mm. sad. It is yeah. sad. All right, let me, let me ask you one more just to not go out on, on such a sad note. As far as the big five goes, I know there are a few folks that are doing victory laps because they feel like now Jay's gone. There's a shot that these that, that there can be some relevance with the other four teams. Uh, do you buy that at all? I think it's going to be a struggle for most of them. Certainly at my alma mater, LaSalle, certainly at St. Joe's, you know, you mm-hmm. see the conditions those programs are in right now. Um, it's going to take some time for them to build themselves back up. It looks like Aaron McKee is, is laying a foundation mm-hmm. at Temple finally, but I still don't love the conference mm-hmm. that Temple is in. And, 
you know, the, the local ties there aren't quite as strong mm-hmm. as they once were. You know, Steve Donahue's a terrific coach at Penn. Um, but in terms of the collective nature of the Big Five, the competitiveness and the relevance on the college basketball scene, you know, I think it's going to take a minute for that to come back. And, you know, the one thing about Villanova being dominant was, yeah, they would beat all those other teams by double digit points every year. But they also got to say that those teams also got to say, hey, we're in the Big Five with Villanova, the right. best team mm-hmm. in the country. Um, so how long that lasts, you know, and, and whether that the fact that Villanova may not be as prestigious as it once was without Jay, you know, could could serve to hurt the Big Five as well. No question. Right, Mike, we mm-hmm. appreciate it, man. Check out Mike's work, inquire.com, you, Mike. at Mike Sealski on Twitter, of course. You got to get the book, man. The phenomenal, the rise, Kobe Bryant, and pursuit of immortality. Mike, appreciate it, man. Always fun chatting with you, buddy. You guys yeah, are bro. the best. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, man. That's, uh, that's Mike Sealski right there. All right, so now is the time for folks to get their good questions lined up and ready to go. Okay, we're going to jump into the Eagles in the draft when we get back, guys, and we're going to we're going to delve into the wide receiver position, the quarterback position. We'll react to what the, some of the things that Howie. And, and Nick had to say yesterday as well. So we'll get all that covered. But, yeah, you want to jump in with some questions. Two o'clock, Keith Pompey is going to join us. We'll talk some Phillies a little bit later as well. But we're going to dive into some football for sure on this Thursday. But first, but first, the luxury bus. I can hear it revving up in the background. Can you guys hear it? The luxury bus? It. Yep. I can all smell right. the diesel. Okay. All right. It's ready to go. The Jacob Media luxury tour bus to the draft extravaganza. Barrett, guess who it's brought to us by? Your good friends and ours at Stateside Vodka. Barrett's got 18 cases he's sitting on right now, as a matter of fact, from Krause. He told he hooked them up. But if you're in the region and you're interested in seeing the luxury tour bus, join us. Ocean Casino Resort and Jacob Media. The, the night's going to be wild. We are going to be doing our show from 12 to 3 there. But also Derek and I and a cast of thousands, including Barrett, including Mike Quick, including Seth Joyner, are going to be doing the show from Ocean Resort Casino as soon as that first round kicks off at 8 o'clock till the end of the first round. So it is going to be an all-day affair, that's for sure. Here's what you need to do in the subject line, all right? Gunner invited me. That's what you need to put in the subject line. Email Krause, K-R-A-U-S-E-Y, at Jacob, J-A-K-I-B, media.com. You do that. And by the way, there's only 36 seats on this bad boy, all right? So you want to get in on this thing. It's a luxury limo bus, 12 seats per show, refreshments, food, special prizes. Three lucky winners will sit in the VIP section for the live show. This is coming for courtesy of the king of content himself, Joe Kraus, Jacob Media. will communicate with everybody this weekend and provide all the details. Are we ready? Doot, doot. Let's go. Luxury bus time. All right. Barrett, Gunner, I'm Rob. We come back. We're talking some football. Get those good questions ready from our comment section. Slam that like button. We are Sports Take Jacob Media. 